Welcome to the CEO of Destiny podcast, where you will find the tools to fulfill the purpose of your generation and wildly succeed in the marketplace. And now your host, Andre J. Benjamin. Greetings, greetings, greetings. Welcome to the CEO of Destiny show. I'm your host, Andre J. Benjamin. I am delighted today to have Miss Julian Marsh of Sandcastle Jewelry. Uh, I love the mission of your business to reflect existing beauty and strength through wearable art. Now on this podcast, we really focus on how people can be a CEO of their own destiny, how they basically can take charge and become a good manager and a steward of that which has been entrusted to them through their greatest investor and how they can bring a return on that investment. And I was really caught because I am constantly, I'm a curious person. I read a lot and I kind of just go out, you know, my wife has to kind of put me on these book abstentions. Like you've got too many books, you know, you're doing too much, but I'm curious about things that keep people inspired and keep people active in the midst of when there can be a seeming drought or almost the palette outside is all, you know, negative, the narratives are negative or whatever it may be. We, the world goes through its different changes. Everybody goes through their different changes, but I'm always sparked up. So there's a magazine in particular where I ran across you. It's Where Women Create. And I look at those spaces because I'm, I'm one who is, I love color and I love life. So it's just, it's, it's inspiring. And I, I came across a great article that covered your story and introduced me to your work. So uh, welcome, Miss Julian Marsh to the podcast and to the show. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. It's kind of fun. Awesome. So can you tell us a bit about you and your origin story and kind of how you got started? I, I, I hear you, you started at seven on the creative journey, but is there anything else that you want to let us know about your origin story? Yeah, sure. Um, if you're, I, I don't know if this spans outside of the Midwest, but there's like a club called like 4-H and it's, um, it's honestly like a little bit agriculture based, like people raise animals, but there's a lot of like home ec kinds of pieces. Um, and so I was a 4-H kid, um, which means a lot if you're here, but not if you're not. <laughs> so we had sewing and competed at fairs and stuff like that. Um, and so kind of with that in mind, I was always, there's always a project of some sort um, in my life. And so um, ended up buying some beads, started straying them when I was uh, seven. I got to thinking about the business side actually just this week because they had me come in for career day at my kid's school. And always I, a joy. <laughs> always a joy. Um, and so <laughs> I was thinking about that and like, okay, how do you make this applicable for, you know, third through fifth graders? And um, I remembered the first, the first dollars that I actually made were because um, in junior high, there was a pop machine. And I did not have parents who were going to give me dollars for the pop machine um, on the daily, but I had friends who did have those parents. And so I would make a bracelet on the bus, sell it to a girl for her pop money, and I'd get a pop. And so... <laughs> 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 they say necessity is the mother of invention. And you said, I got to yeah, get this pop money. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. So um, I think, uh, I think sticking in jewelry, honestly, um, you know, you described yourself as a curious person and I would describe myself similarly that um, it's an art form I've stuck with because there's so many different facets to it. And so I feel like I can always learn something new, do something different. Um, and while you know, it maintains the same as far as it may still be jewelry. Um, what I do today looks totally different than what I did even last year at this time, you know, things like that. So. Awesome. What, what would you describe as wearable art? Can you describe what that is? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I do mostly, uh, mostly make jewelry. And so I also kind of like control of things. And so I'm making, I'm, when I say I make it, uh, I'm starting with sheet metal and hunks of rock and I'm cutting rock and I'm making my own, um, making my own stones for a specific look. I'm refining the metal back for a specific thing. I make a lot of my own tools, um, partially out of control and partially out of uh, budgetary. It's easier. And so, um, so I really like to control the whole process. So there's a lot of like art that goes into that, um, and then, yeah, and it's essentially, it's made so people can wear it. So 
hopefully when people wear my pieces, um, they, people notice like, you know, it's like, oh, wow, that's not, you can get that at Target, you know? And so that's kind of a fun thing to get to do. How did you, how did you even get the skill set for, I mean, so you said you take these raw materials and then you start, you know, what, uh, what you, you see a hunk of rock and then do you, like, is there an image in your head? <laughs> I mean, like, how did yeah. you, you look at a photo and then you say, do you sketch out something first and say, that's what I, you like, kind of walk us through that I that that yeah through that process sure sure so um I mean like I said I started like stringing beads when I was seven and just have continued to build on um I really wanted to go to art school um my parents are both in education um they weren't big fans of that idea <laughs> and um of course being a teenager I wasn't going to listen to that either and so um I it, I ended up um, visiting with a man who eventually uh, made my wedding ring, actually, and he was very influential in um, looking through what I had created up to that point. You know, I was like 18, I had a limited portfolio, but I'd done a few things, and he just really directed me well and said, I don't think you'll ever stop learning, I don't think you'll ever stop creating things, um, and I think you have your aesthetic figured out. Um, you should go to school for something that's going to um, help influence this and get it out. And so I actually ended up going to school for marketing um, and kind of like worked my way back into my jewelry business after that. But um, a lot of the things that I've learned, I've either um, done trial and error. I've picked a lot of good brains. Um, whenever I meet anyone who does something, I want to know more about that. Like even if it's um, an HVAC person that has good metal skills. And I'm like, wait, how did you do this? And what tools did you use to bend that 90 degrees? And um, so I've done a lot of research in that realm and read a lot of books and um, audited at different colleges that have better uh, three-dimensional art than the college that I got my degree from. And so, yeah, so a lot so, of different ways. So wait, let's back up a little bit. So you said you had a desire to go to art school, right? When uh -huh. was that? When, and you're a teenager, about what time was this? You know, is this that would have been right in high school or freshman? Like circa like year, years, is that what you're asking? No, not like the year, just to say, I'm like, what what age range were you in? Were you in high school? Were you in middle school when you started to? Yeah, no, I was probably, um, I was probably like 18 when I was like looking at, you know, starting to look at colleges. Well, probably 17. I graduated from high school at 17. So probably my senior year kind of looked at this, what options are out there. And then um, honestly came back to it again, midway through my college career, wasn't loving my major. Um, I was a communications major at the time. I was just trying to get in and out as fast as possible and started what was looking it that at- you didn't, What was it that you didn't like about the major? What was not connecting with you? Because there are yeah, college question. students that listen to this. So I want to- yeah, for sure. You know, I think um, for me, I felt like it wasn't it wasn't an inspiring major for me. Um, I also it was a pretty small school, so I had a limited um, a limited amount of professors, and just listening to my communications professors talk about what they did, they had like a passion and, and a desire for that that I just didn't have, and I thought I don't I'm not going to make it in your area if I don't have the same like passions and desires and there was um another professor there she was in the marketing department and I really connected with her and I would definitely say like for any college kids listening like that is the key to getting the most out of your college experience is to find that one professor that you're like this is my person and they will bend over backwards for you and it is just so great to have like you know, that expertise and wisdom in your life. And so I just remember talking to her and being like, here's my heart. Like, I want to get out fast, but also I'm not loving this. And she was like, I feel like you might like marketing and I'm going to throw you in the only class that has an opening. It's a senior level class. I think you'll be fine. Um, see what happens. And I aced it and I loved it. Yeah. And that was where it was like, okay, this is the thing. Like, and I just, just kept wanting to know more. And I, I think what really drove me there too was that I loved this idea of connecting people who were searching for something with something else and so I think there's a whole philosophy behind like 
marketing strategy where the, it kind of gets a bad rap or it's like, oh, well, how do you sell people things that they don't need? Well, that's not really my desire, but I love being able to connect people who are looking for something with the thing they're looking for because that's not always easy to find. So it's create. So it sounds like your, your uh, viewpoint of kind of, we hear it, as you say, you know, oh, but sales and marketing, it's just, it's so, it's so, it's the cringy thing that people, but we're always selling. We're always selling our ideas. We have to sell our ideas to our parents, to our spouse, to our children. That's life. So marketing maybe is, sounds from your vantage point is more of creating an awareness of what's out there for people that are searching for that. Yeah, absolutely. And finding, you know, and to some degree, finding the people who are searching for it. And, um, and in that, I think you start to see your niche, right? Like, like I, I make jewelry. There's a lot of women that wear jewelry, but there's a lot of women who wear jewelry who aren't my target audience either. And so, you know, starting to really like know that and, um, and build that has been, um, really, really fun. And honestly, it has been very, um, it's become a very relational job. And so that's, uh, that's a cool thing for me too. That's really my favorite thing is all the people that I get to meet and the stories that they, that they bring to me, because a lot of times people have a story that they want to have a memento of, and they feel like a necklace or a ring is really like, you know, a great way to be able to wear their story. And also I think it opens the door for them to share it with other people. When people are like, oh man, I love your ring. They're like, Hey, let me tell you about it. And it's not really about the ring at all. It's, It's about what that represents to them. See, and, I, and that's what I want to dig into that because I'm intrigued <laughs> by this concept of wearable art because, I mean, because you can hear, you know, sometimes people can have a bunch of stuff thrown at them and some companies and can just produce stuff just because they know people will buy it. But the way you say it, wearable art makes it sound more deliberate and intentional when you talk about wearing your story. Can, stories, can you, even these... Um, phrases and these terms that you put on it, when were you introduced to wearable art and why is it so important to you? Because it sounds like you have some, so you you don't just look at it as like, oh, let me make something so I can sell it to somebody and I can get these bills paid, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I think um, probably one of the first, uh, one of the first times that I started to really understand who my audience was, was probably my it's probably my sophomore or junior year of college. Um, I think I had $12 in my checking account. I think my parents paid a booth fee for me. Maybe I paid it with my summer job. I can't remember. I spent like $100 to set up at this art fair, which was a lot of money for me to spend. <laughs> Absolutely. Bro college. And so I think in hindsight, I think I had to pay the booth fee, but then they ended up buying me a tent because after I like signed up for it. You had to have a tent, but again, $12, like I'm out. And so, <laughs> um, so that was their, their, their investment. Um, and so I remembered I worked all day and I made like over a thousand dollars at like $30 price points. So I had been up a lot of nights making all kinds of things. And by the end of the day, one, I was exhausted, but two, I realized that a person could step into my booth and I could tell you within 30 seconds whether or not they were going to buy something. Like wow. the, I was getting this visual of these are the people who are going to buy your stuff. And I remember um, just like listening a lot to, it was, it was just great marketing research, honestly, the feedback that I was getting from people and the things that they would say that I'd be like, yep, that, that resonates with me and that describes my work. And so I think um, a lot of, a word that I used for a while they, that I liked or a phrase, I guess, was they would say, um, it's like uniquely eclectic. Wow. <laughs> and so I was like, that's true. And I, I started to realize that um, I was selling things to people who weren't necessarily even wearing the same clothes that we were seeing with everybody else. So if you came in with your friend group and you were all three dressed in your own style, probably all three of you were going to find something that you wanted. But if you came in with your friend group and you were all dressed exactly the same, I'm probably not your place because I'm not going to have three matching things to carry out. Wow. And, <laughs> yeah. And so the, the reflecting, you know, I mean, you said like my mission statement, you know, to reflect existing beauty and strength. Honestly, that's both in the materials on the arts as well as the person who's wearing it. And I have found that 
the majority of my clients are people who are um, fairly competent and sometimes are finding confidence in a new season um, or a new story or in accepting the story that uh, that is now theirs. And that those are the places that I love to get to just like dig in and visit with these people and hear their stories and, you know, just point out the strength that's, that's there, you know, and, um, and I love that. And that's been a really, that's been like an unexpected, like blessing through that. And so I think I've had a fair amount of people who will like, look at my pieces and they're like, well, this isn't just jewelry. I feel like it's art. And um, I always hesitate in that because there's, um, as with everything, there's a lot of different facets to personalities in different industries. Um, but I don't always, I don't always click with other artists. Um, sometimes there are people who, you know, they'll say, um, oh, well, what was like your inspiration or your breakthrough? And I'm like, I don't know, I had 20 minutes and this material that I need to use up, which is not a good art answer. Um, but realistically, a lot of times, like my, my, my breakthrough, if you will, or the thing that was inspiring was really thinking of the person who was going to wear that piece, um, whether that's a custom piece or me creating something, something else. Um, I really always am designing with these women in mind and trying to um, help them showcase their own like inner beauty and strength. First off, I love the fact that you gave us how you even observed and you did your own market research of different people that the foot traffic that came and then as you started to notice as well how how you connect with people and almost discovering what you know many call now the avatar of who it exactly exactly is your avatar who's your customer who are you who are you creating for who are you designing for it's amazing i also want to i don't want to glaze over because i love process and i love digging deep into process so when you talked about um, take us back to emotionally where you were at. You went from $12 to $1,000, okay? It's not like, <laughs> we're not gonna just breeze past that. And then I hit $1,000, like, no, you went in and you were like, this better work. You know, there had to be that mindset of, my parents invested in me. And not only that, I'm, I'm trying to really bet on myself and see, does this work? Can you take us back to where you were at, both emotionally, Mentally, how did that feel to look at and to count up those final numbers and then to know, you know, if there, if you sold out, how did that, wh where were you at? Take, take us to that process. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think, uh, I think there's always like these things like, um, be they goals or just events that we always think like, if that happened, that would feel like X, Y, and Z. And I, and I think that we sometimes um, maybe like, dramatize them in our heads right so we think oh man that would be a real big thing and at the end of the day it's it's just a thing right mm -hmm. and at the end of the day I just remember my mom like she was like my bookkeeper person and helped me like sell stuff and which was so sweet of her and all I could think was like I just want a cheeseburger and I want a nap sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you're fried you're fried <laughs> yes. so I just I remember her being like aren't you so excited and she'd like she'd like total up when we'd have like a little space and then she'd circle it and just like try and like low key, like show me these numbers. And they just made like zero sense to me. Like I was like, yes. I don't even know how this is happening. Um, and so I was, I was just so tired. I was just yes. so tired. You couldn't work. You were on the other end of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, and I think it was, I think really it was so shocking that at the, I had really felt like, well, if I make my hundred dollars back, then that would be good. Like that would be acceptable, you know? And so, um, you know, making a lot more than that, I was like, oh, okay. Like, um, this is something I could really do. And at that point, I also found myself thinking, I mean, this was still in the middle of Kansas. So that's where I live now and um, where I went to school. And I can remember that also like kind of making me process like, well, if I could do that here, what could I do somewhere else? Mm. And kind of losing some contentment in that, and at that point, I like had looked up an art school in Chicago and was like, okay, actually back on the table, instead of being like, actually, this process is working. You are doing what you should do here. Being like, nope, nope, I think I'm going to look at some other options. And so process through this art school thing again, my parents lovingly just <laughs> waited for me to process through that. Um, 
but, uh, and they just, they really did just let me walk through the whole thing and be like, okay, find out what's going to transfer, find out how much that's going to cost you, find out how much longer you're going to be in school. And, uh, and ultimately like, I was like, yeah, I'm just, I'm going to stay here and, and, and do this thing. And, um, I think always in the back of my head was this idea that I would move somewhere bigger and that I would do it bigger. And at this point in my life, I'm just really glad I didn't. Like, I'm just really glad that I didn't. I think that had I went that route, I would have been looking at um, creating things in a commercial capacity that all of a sudden it wouldn't be the place that you can't find three of the same thing because I, there's 300 or 3,000. And all of a sudden I've lost this target audience that I saw in my booth um, there that I would switch people. And, um, and I don't think that would work well for me because I'm also not those people. And so I don't understand all of the um, decisions that go into that. And so I think I would not have, I don't know how it would have ended, but I don't think it would have been as satisfying as what I do now because I do have the time to be able to pour into my clients at the level that I'm at. And I, I really like that. So that level of personalization versus being able to, if you ha are doing it more in a commercial side, side, it's you turn it into a commodity and, and, and now you're competing on price and you're losing because that whole personal field of how you wanted to connect with stories and how you're creating for a specific demographic shifts. I, I like how you spoke on being in Kansas City. One of my questions for you that I had was, where are you hailing from and how does that play into how you create and what you create? How does that play into, how is that part of your story? Sure, yeah, and I'm actually, I'm not even in Kansas City. I'm just in Kansas. <laughs> That's our state. <laughs> yeah. So I um, I grew up in a town of like 2,500 people. Um, and I still have fabulous clients that I mail stuff back to my home zip code. And that's, um, that's a fun thing too, to know that there are people who, you know, supported you with a pop dollar on the bus that now live in Washington, DC and buy some of my stuff there. So, um, so that's, that's kind of fun. But so I grew up in a really small town and then, um, my husband and I now live, we live outside of Wichita and we live in the country and, um, I, I'm really bad at numbers of towns, like really bad. So I would say, so the town that we live closest to um, has a Walmart, but not a Target. And that's how I tell the size of places. So we have a Walmart, but not a Target. <laughs> that's, that's big. You're like, if the commercial guys don't come here, then we, that's, that's <laughs> actually a good, good gauge. When you talked about being college educated and, and you talked about marketing as well as communications in some of your studies, if I heard correctly and I've done my research right what how did that play into your actual work that you do now does it does it play into does it play a role does your training yeah absolutely so I um I are you familiar with Gallup uh the Gallup organization strengths quest yes, yes I am so okay so my top five are uh communication ideation strategic futuristic and includer um, and so, which means nothing to anyone listening who doesn't know about that, but totally go look it up. It's way better than the Enneagram. And I know that I'm going to take some shade for saying that out loud, but check it out. Um, so it's great. Anyhow, with that kind of strength setup, the strategic and futuristic, I have a hard time thinking about today. I'm always thinking about tomorrow. And that has always been true for me. And so at 17, graduate, I'm like, oh, you know what? College costs money. So you know what I can do? Work harder and get out fast. That was my goal. So I was like, if I'm not going to be a doctor, let's just wrap this mess up. So um, I thought I could get out in three years. And I could have if I stayed with communications. Um, when I switched to marketing, I was going to have to add an extra semester. And I knew I could still pick up my communications degree as well. So I did go ahead and double major. So I had both of those bachelors. Um, I would say that the marketing side, well, I, I think there are a lot of things that I learned in both of those um, degrees, but uh, ultimately I feel like education teaches you how to continue to educate yourself. Both of those um, industries are constantly changing. Um, I mean, I remember constantly being preached at, you know, the media is the message in college. That made no sense to me. It makes a lot more sense today. And we'll just leave that at that. 
Um, and so, but things like marketing, you know, I'm marketing on platforms and things that weren't even, uh, they weren't even a thing. I mean, Facebook at the time that I was in college, you had to like, and I actually did this. I was the nerd that did this for our school. You had to actually petition that you were a real life college to get Facebook so like I had to fill out all this information about the history of our college of wait for it less than 500 students to say we were real I'm sure they were like side eye I thought I'm real that's not real she just collected some friends and made up a fake college <laughs> so I mean things like that you know I have to be able to on the marketing side there's just always things to learn and figure out and so I think the marketing that, right there, by the way shout out to your marketing skills to get you <laughs> lobby to get you back on Facebook. Keep going. <laughs> right, right. So, um, yeah, so I would say that there, there are a lot of things, like, as far as, like, just understanding how business works and target audience. And, um, like, I told the kids this week, I was like, if I sell five bracelets on the bus, but beads cost $2, can I get five pops? Like, did I... Did I have a trade or did I have a business? Like, and so that was fun, like, listening to them, like, process through that. Like, I'm like, yeah, if I run out of all my beads, I still have to have money in the business. And so kind of that back half, that doesn't really change, right? Like, and that's not my favorite part of my business for sure. But being able to know that side is probably um, one of the more helpful things in my education. Absolutely. When many people say that our, our culture right now is more driven by events rather than process. So for instance, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the wedding over the marriage or the childbirth over the actual pregnancy or the weight loss and the muscles over the, you know, deliberate eating and the changes in your eating and the, you know, strict workout regimens and getting to sleep at specific times or, or refreshing, doing different things to take care of mental health. What would you, I mean, even if you look at uh, somebody who's a who we consider in our society a super achiever, whether it's Venus Williams or Serena or, or Michael Phelps, his Wikipedia page has like 19,000 words and only 27 of the words are devoted to talking about the actual process that is responsible for all those other words. How important is process for you in what you do? Because you talk, you talk a bit about some of these aspects of process for you. That's why I, I'm fascinated by and intrigued by when you talked about being the, the child on the bus yourself and being and saying, okay, parents won't give me money for pop every day. I might be able to get it a few days from them, but I can't convince them every day. What do I have within my own hands to be able to create and add value to someone and you sell them a bracelet and they give you them. I mean, so can, how important is process to you? And can you break down a little bit about that? Cause I'm going to actually pivot to talking about asking you questions about, um, where you work out of so we have yeah for sure no I think uh I think that that's really funny I actually had um a bracelet that I wore um a lot of last year that just said do the process <laughs> wow. do the process <laughs> because um I think you're right like we absolutely are in a society that we see the finish and um and then there's this huge disconnect as to how we got there and um I mean that's absolutely true in in everything, and, and you pointed on so many things there. Um, and I see that especially like in, in young people. Um, I am, work closely with some high school girls and just like, how do you uh, encourage them that you don't wake up and have these things happen, that like, you're not, yes, some people post a TikTok video and have 10,000 followers immediately. Okay. That's not the normal, right? Like. No. Um, and so I think for me, um, looking at the process like is, is huge and also a hard thing. So for me, I have went through the process of creating this jewelry and I can do that all day long. Um, but there's also this business aspect and those processes. And honestly, I even had um, a business coach last year for a short time, which was like a hard thing to be like, okay, is this going to give me a return on my investment um, to go through this? But we had talked on the phone and she said, I think that you need encouragement to set up your behind the scenes processes. And she was totally right. And sometimes for me with my process, um, I want to jump the gun on some things. So I might create something and I want to show it. Like I want to share it. I know that people are going to like it. 
but I'm also not ready to fulfill that. Like I know that my custom line is so long, or I know that I need to stock a couple of stores first. And so there's this, um, there's always this huge temptation to jump the process and to try and go for the quick fix. But ultimately that always leads to frustration for me um, and frustration for my customers. And I don't want to do that. Like, oh, hey, here's what I'm launching. But also it might be six months from now. Like, no, make the plan, do the process and, and get there. And um, so part of doing the process for me too, is that you're doing that every day. And I don't think the process ever gets to end. And so I'm always trying to, um, you know, finagle things, change things. And, um, and I think for like young people, I think, think about what I always encourage people that I talk to, like, you know, I feel like more often than not, like I'll be told that like a teenager, like, oh, I want to be a YouTuber. I'm like, awesome. What are you doing about that right now? Well, I'm telling you that I want to be a YouTuber. Well, did you make a video? Like, do you have a YouTube channel? What? No, no. I'm like, do you have a one-to-one -one initiative at your school? Do you have a laptop? Do you have a, like, what do you have? Like, how can you do this? How can you do this right now? And I think looking at how can I do what I can right now and slowly work up to other things is, is really, you know, a huge battle within the process and trying to start developing a process instead of hoping that someone hands you a business, hands you 10,000 followers and all the things, and then, you know, you're not even going to know what to do with it. You're going to spend all your $5 and you're not going to have a business. You're going to have a flash in the pan. One of my mentors told me years ago and said, don't allow your talent to take you where your character can't keep you right? Mm. So don't allow your talent to get you to a place where your character can't keep you. And so you're, uh, there was a, 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 a <laughs> juvenile, the movies are really juvenile, but it, it, people have a certain palette, they watch it. But Adam Sandler, I used to really be into a lot of Adam Sandler films, <laughs> the disclaimer. And, and what does it say about Adam Sandler's films that most of his films, it said that people watch them secretly at home. They wouldn't go see them in the theater. <laughs> they, they looked at the stats and they said that people were watching them at home. His biggest numbers were people watching them at home, which is hilarious. So, but I went and saw this movie click and uh, without giving the spoiler alert for people who haven't seen it, it's just he's meets this mysterious figure that gives him a remote control because he goes to Bed Bath & Beyond <laughs> And there's bed, bath, and then he finds the section called Beyond. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so he gets this control, and this control allows for him to fast forward through things. But you, you're missing out on the character development. You're missing out on the lessons that are had there. So I love how you talked about someone coming to you and saying, I want to be viral. I'm going to blow up. I'm going to have, I'm going to be famous for being famous. What are you going to be famous for? I'm going to be, I'm going to be <laughs> celebrated for, for just being famous. You know, I'm going to wake up and go shopping every day and just be on a reality show. I don't know. It's, it's weird that we have, we've um, basically discouraged people from process, but the actual process is where the actual gold is. And I know it's not fun to talk about process, but it, it is, it is very beneficial for those that actually know that there are no shortcuts. I mean, and I, I hate to say it because I know there's a lot of people that listen to that and they, they may think that. Um, so when we have, we have CEOs, we have business owners, we have investors, we have different people from various jurisdictions of life. And one of the things that, um, there's a verse that hit me and also something that is, was depicted in the, you know, the Charlton Heston 10 commandments and also the Prince of Egypt where God says to him, what's in your hand? You know, and the staff that he's been carrying for all this time as a shepherd is now going to be used for something else. And so I, I, I love the fact that you and I that you pointed out that you started to look at, well, what do I have of value? What can I do? What you know, most people never get to do that inventory of self and even how the self-awareness that you spoke to of betting on yourself, even to getting a coach. Most of us don't want to go through that process of saying, Oh, what a waste of money. I mean, why am I going to spend money on something that I don't even know if it's going to actually pan out? Why would I? Well, because you talked about things like the strength finder. There's other people take the disc assessment. Other people take the, uh, you know, there's the Colbay index. There's so many of them that people can take. But 
it has to be for the person that almost has the growth mindset and the self-awareness for, for doing that. Uh, what can you speak to us about the pearl? Talk to us about the pearl. We want to know. About I will. I'm going to, I'm going to bounce back for just a I, second on processes. If you don't care, that's okay. I, no, I won't. <laughs> um, you know, like, yeah, you talk about the movie click. I, I think about, um, there's a play called Our Town. It's an old classic like play. I'm sure it's been turned into a film, but there's a line in that um, where it sounds creepy. It's not. It's great. But they're they're in the grave, but they're talking to each other, like in this like afterlife kind of context, and they're able to see people living life and just kind of going through the motions. And the one girl says to her mother, like, how like do they not understand the beauty that they're missing? Like, doesn't anybody recognize how precious and beautiful life is in every moment? And I think the mom's response says like. Um, some artists and poets, maybe, but for the most part, like we don't. And that was a play that we actually did in high school. And that line always like resonated with me um, because I think that we don't always see like, you know, the beauty and the things that are happening. But I would say that I have found finding process and following process, although sometimes meticulous, um, leads to like a lot greater reward. And that doing the process for me, um, is a lot more uh, rewarding because I'm in control of it. And I think when I put out markers that I'm not in control of going viral or, you know, things like that, um, that's easy to be very discouraged instead of just being like, okay, what's in my control and to go ahead and like, um, yeah, and seek that and seek that kind of process. If that makes sense. But the pearl, I can tell you about the pearl. The pearl is before you oh, yes. the pearl, I want to build off what you said. You said the statement that it's almost, and, and this is what many have found has been therapeutic or helpful for them during this challenging time that many are going through is to learn to control that which they can control. So it's, con it's controlling the controllables. Can you delve a little bit more into that about why that is important and how you found that has been helpful? Because you talked about almost this ideal of some rubric and some metric that you can't Oh, I, you know, I'm good. I'm going to have 7 million people by the end of the month following me on, you know, some nebulous platform. But what does that mean to you about how did you even find to scale back from the ideal to the actual thing that you can have impact with? Yeah, I think for me, um, I started kind of looking at like all of the things that I do and finding like, where am I finding the joy in that? And I found that... I didn't have as much joy from bringing home a great deal of money from a craft show um, as much as when I would be working through a new piece and trying to do something. And maybe I had invested, sometimes I've been working on things for years, but sometimes because people are like, you can't do that. And I'm like, I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> and to, to know that like, sometimes like cutting you know, cutting a rock that um, had shattered several times on me that I just really struggled with that material and finally coming out with exactly what I had been going for and knowing all the hours and time behind that, I felt far more proud of myself for those things and for like sticking with that than, um, than even when I would actually sell the ring that that went into. And so um, being able to find that, and I think I think like for young people, sometimes that's missed and um, there's just a lot of value and pride that comes in working hard for something. And even if that's, um, you know, trying to plant a garden or, you know, setting out to run a mile every week or whatever that might be, when you actually start realizing that you're capable of working hard for something, whatever that is, I think that that's like a very empowering thing to be like, you do, you don't have to you are you are in control right um so yeah <laughs> awesome i love it uh the so the pearl take us to the pearl and, and and unpack how the the origin story of the pearl and what the pearl means to you sure sure so um i have had the blessing of having like a working space to some capacity um for a little while now but uh, even my college dorm room, I had like a bunch of tackle boxes that I'd shove under my bed um, when I would pick them up. My 
sweet roommate dealt with a lot of junk scattered around our room often. <laughs> um, and so I've kind of always had like some sort of thing with me that I want to make. And as I grew up and then as Caleb and I got married, we had a spare bedroom before having kids. And so whatever spare space there was in the house was like unspokenly mine. Like I'd move my workbenches in, do all the things. And um, we had a small garden shed at our last house that I worked out of. And then when we moved to the house we're currently in, there was not extra space. Um, we were up to four kids and we don't have more bedrooms than that. <laughs> and so, um, so I worked out of the garage and just kind of started putting money aside for someday something and not really knowing what that was going to be. In my head, I really wanted that to be a downtown building. I thought I'd like to move downtown, move all my stuff there. When all my kids are in school, I'll drop them off at school. I'll go to work at my studio. It'll be great. I have this whole idealistic thing. And I guess technically at that point in time, we had three kids. And um, then we had our four. <laughs> And so um, that set my timeline back. I had kind of sat down when my oldest went to kindergarten and went, how many more years do I have of staying at home and working and balancing all of this? Um, and what does my business plan look like? And so while it probably looks fairly unintentional to a lot of people, there was a lot of intention and process in growing my business from what does it look like when I have kids at home that are zero to four? to what does it look like when I can get my kids in school and actually separate my time where I have working time and I have mom time. And so looking at that, I thought, wow, I'm still quite a few years out from having everyone in, uh, in kindergarten, which would be a full time here, everyone would be in school. So I looked around and I actually ended up passing on my downtown building option for a while and built, well, really just brought in like a portable uh, shed space um, on our, we have five acres. And so we brought it in. So it's still separate, separate from the house, but it's, um, it's enough space for me. When I brought it in, I, I cut out all of my machines to scale um, and played like paper dolls in the, to make sure everything would fit and work. Because if I was going to make the investment, I needed to know it would work. And the timeline on it was, this is going to let me know if I can work from home and keep doing this or if I still think I want to move downtown by the time everybody's in school and um, and making sure that financially things are back aligned. So it'll all be paid for by then. And um, We did most of the renovations ourselves to make it work. And so I have this space where people can come out. And so I host clients there. I do a couple open houses. I've done some classes, but it's like, I think 14 by 36, I think, so. Can you go uh, back a little and talk about the different iterations before you got to the Pearl? What were the other spaces that you worked out of? Because I want people to hear that and not get discouraged if they have a starting point, because I, like we talk about the event, you know, and people saw that if they saw the, the, the you know, the hundreds of thousands of, or so that are reading the magazine you were in, or, you know, people who might go to your website and then they see it and they say, oh man, I don't even have anything close to that. I'm wasting my time. I'm not going to get to this. Why, who am I kidding? You know what I mean? But all the negative voices that come in saying these type of things, what would you, can you walk through the iterations of what you had to work with first and how? Oh yeah, absolutely. So I had my, my shoe boxes and tackle boxes under my bed in college. Um, it would have been similarly. Shout out to roommates of creatives in college, right? <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Man, she, she made my, my world work. <laughs> uh, she's the best. So did that. Then, um, post-college I lived I had a new roommate um, who I don't think knew what she was in for in that realm. And I was like, hey, she was like, she was a school teacher. She said, can I put my desk in the dining room? And I said, yes, if I can put my desk in the dining room. And she said, yes, I'm so sorry, Jennifer. And my desk at that point um, was this large, I still have it. If you've seen the magazine, it's in there. Um, it's a large wooden um, cabinet that was like a baker's cabinet that my dad kind of rebuilt and reconfigured. And so it has a whole bunch of boxes, little tiny boxes at the top. 
that we're all organized with all these tiny little findings. So we had like a card table with two chairs for our dining room <laughs> table. And then we had this like massive desk and I would try and not torch there because that wasn't really <laughs> in the rules. And, um, and then her desk um, across from me. So we used that space. And then um, when Caleb and I got married, we had, um, we actually ended up using like an open, like an open room for our bedroom so that I could have a room with a door um, so that when I hammered, <laughs> that would, I could close that off. I mean, he has a drum set and it was above that room. So that was kind of just our loud space of the house. So shout out to those poor neighbors. Um, and so I used that. And then when we moved, we bought our first home. We had one child and it was a three bedroom house. The child was in one bedroom. I had all of my working stuff crammed in like a bedroom that was like an eight by 10. And um, I actually remember meeting, I have a really great mentor and friend named Roger and his son is about my age. And he came over and met me for the first time. And he said, you store a soldering iron on top of a sewing machine. And that's all I need to know about how you and dad are friends. Yeah. And I was like, absolutely. If there's space, then we just keep stacking for a while. So I used that. Um, then I ended up, I was pregnant with our second child. And so we had some friends help us uh, dig a trench for electricity to our garden shed out back. And I moved everything that was in that room to the garden shed. And then that it's probably two years after that, we were then up to three kids and um, I came across, my uncle came across an auction that had um, lapidary equipment, like rock cutting equipment. And he's a fabulous person. And he ended up uh, calling me and was like, hey, this is going on. Do you want any of this? Like, is this, I think I first got this picture of a machine at that point, I was auditing classes at the college because they had a lot of machine equipment that I didn't, couldn't support the overhead on. And so it was cheaper for me to audit the classes. So shout out if you're trying to do something in three-dimensional arts. When I was like eight, there was a woman who told me, if you're ever in a city that has a college, see if you can audit the art classes. It's the best way to get your hands on the top of the line equipment for the least amount of money. Yeah. So... Um, so yeah, so I did that and audited this class. And so used all their equipment. He sends me a picture of this genie rock grinder and said, is this, is this a jewelry thing? And I said, yes, are you at an auction or a garage sale? And he said an auction. And I just immediately started like Googling pictures of other equipment and sending it back to him and being like, Hey, what about this? What about this? And if you get this, get this. And he'd text back and be like, well, what should I get some rocks? Like there's some rocks but I don't know what I'm looking at. And I was like, just get some colorful ones. And <laughs> just went back and forth. And he, I, when I went up to visit him, he was unloading a whole bunch of stuff from the auction. And I said, oh, did you find some good stuff? And he like took a deep breath and he said, well, after you told me what the first machine was worth and what you wanted to spend on it, I just bought everything that had rock dust on it because I figured if you couldn't use it, I could probably resell it. And and then I was sitting there, you know, thinking about my bank account numbers and how much had I green let him to spend that day. <laughs> and um, just in a totally providential moment, he had purchased that entire Lapidary studio for the amount of money I had told him he could spend on the genie. Wow. And so that was just, I mean, that was huge. And um, it obviously opened a lot of doors for me to get to do different things, but he bought so much rock material that it also um, allowed me to feel a lot more free with cutting that I felt like I could try this because I didn't have, you know, a limited supply or um, so much invested in it that I shouldn't just try it. And so that has been fun. And that's allowed me to, I mean, I've given lots of different rocks away to different people. Um, because I probably have more than I'll cut in my lifetime <laughs> from that alone. And it's still continued to collect. So here we are. <laughs> Did you grow up around art? Um, yes and no. 
Um, I think one of the cool things about being in small towns, and I'm probably uh, prejudiced to this because that's what I grew up in. Um, I feel like I hear a lot of people be like, well, I need my kid to be in a bigger school because there's more opportunities. And I would, I would argue that 100%. And I love um, one of my friends who's a teacher said, if he could go back to teaching, he's taught at all levels, he would go back to the smallest school because he said, when I was at a 6A school, if a one-armed kid wanted to play basketball, there's no way. Like, there's no way. Well, you can try out. Good luck. And he was like, at the 1A school, if the one-armed kid wants to play basketball, you're like, all right, let's go open the gym, figure it out. And I think, I think that that is true when there's um, smaller groups of people. You know, we still all have the same amount of resources as far as time. And I think that I just knew lots of people. And so I know that um, there were some really fabulous artists in my life that weren't necessarily, um, they weren't my parents. You know, my mom, my mom sews and she's like really great. My dad's a really good um, craftsman and woodworker, but neither one of them devoted like a substantial amount of time to that or like sold that outside of our home. We just, you know, used the things that they made. And, um, but like, I think about like my junior high art teacher was phenomenal. Um, he has, he has since moved to New York and continues to be just an artist. Um, I had um, a Sunday school teacher that uh, she's a fascinating individual, but she was always very artistic, ended up having um, a brain tumor that when removed, um, she lost some abilities, but her art took a completely different turn um, and has just become just absolutely incredible. And as part of that, she feels like she needs to be thankful for every day that she has. And so I think for going on, she may be going on 20 years of this, she has painted the sunrise every single morning as an act of thankfulness for having another day. And that has become an interesting like um, ministry and also um, business for her is that people from all over the world contact her and want specific day sunrises um, because like, they're very meaningful. So like she gave me the day of our wedding and we have the day that we adopted our daughter. And so it's really cool. So Debbie paints the sunrise. If you want to look her up, she's really fun. Um, and then when I first moved out on my own after college, well, there was a friend of mine growing up, her mom had an art studio. Um, her name was Carolyn. And I can remember Carolyn just being so generous with her space and her paints. And um, she would never be like, oh, that's off limits. Unless it's because she was actually working on like you wanted water, watercolor paper, she'd tear out watercolor paper. I mean, she just was awesome. And when I moved to Salina after I graduated, she lived there and I went to like an art show thing and saw her and met her two friends and they had an actual studio building and they just gave me a key to it. And they were like, if you can't use your torch in your, you know, space at your apartment, like just bring it down here, you can do it here. And like, um, and I love that. And I, I kind of do have this uh, mentality that I say, uh, I feel like artists are really generous and craftspeople are stingy. <laughs> and I think, I think like artists, like we're all like, none of us want to make the same thing and we, we get that. So it's not like, it's like, oh, I would like to know exactly where you source your materials for this thing so I can make a copy of it. Like, we're like, hey, you know, where'd you get those? Because I have this other idea that I want to take on and we can help each other get places faster. Um, but we're kind of all running in our own lane. A little bit about technical skills. Can you talk uh, one of the huge ones that I see a lot of creative struggle with is relating well to timeframes. Uh, how do you manage priorities and manage energy and manage time? You know, and I, and I broke it up like that specifically on purpose because people try to give that general time management but no how are you managing your priorities how are you managing your energy and then how are you managing the actual time absolutely well that's always changing <laughs> that is absolutely. just uh that is a moving target um in my life i think uh because my husband and i did make the decision for me to be home with our kids like while they were tiny um he's also an entrepreneur and has his own business and in that kind of marriage relationship, um, we always, we tend to use the words um, like teamwork kinds of words because we really do feel like we're a team. We know we can't, neither one of us can do what we do without the other person. And I am so grateful for a husband who like recognizes that and um, 
is very cognizant that we both have like different roles that have to be fulfilled. And sometimes we fill in the gaps for each other and that's really great. Um, but I would say what I'm kind of recognizing is that I always want like, because the way we've prioritized our world and also we don't live super close to any of our families. So we don't have like grandparents who can grab kids after school. Um, now that being said, I have a great friend group. I mean, even today as I'm recording this, I know I have to go pick up my husband from an airport and I've outsourced two kids with friends after school so they can make it to their activities and um, you know stuff like that has to happen. But if somebody gets sick, I'm gonna be the one who shows up at the school to pick up the puking kid because that's just where it's at. So that is always, always has to be my highest priority. Um, for me with art stuff, I've started to realize that there are some things that it doesn't matter who does it as long as it gets done. Um, and that has been very freeing as a mom to be like, it doesn't matter who scrubs the toilets at my house so long as they're vaguely clean regularly. And for me to be able to be like, oh, hold on. So I have this friend, Chrissy, and she has a house cleaning business and I can sell X number of earrings so that Chrissy can clean my house. And I have a sweet husband who's like, babe, I don't even care if it's a wash. If you're happier doing your thing and we're supporting her doing her thing, let's do that. And so looking for those like uh, kind of interesting ways to outsource different things. I have somebody who brings a meal into us once a week that I pay her for that. I have um, the gal who cleans my house every two weeks. And, and honestly, some of those things came out of my business coaching class that she was like, hey, you're spending all the plates. What do you want to drop? Like what? And, and so I wrote down a lot of things like, well, what would it cost for somebody to do my laundry? Ooh, a lot of money because there's a lot of people in this house. Guess I'm going to have to still do laundry. Um, so I have tried to kind of, as the kids, I'm still kind of finagling all my days because the kids are just now back in school and that's kind of shifting, um, trying to kind of block out my time for different things. And so to be able to be like, okay, on Mondays, if I have blocked out that that's the day I'm pulling the house back together, making the meal plans, making sure we have food, then I can do all that by itself. And then I can move on to, if I can block out a whole day that I can work, um, I try and work very strategically. And so while I might have customs on my plate and also have ideas that I wanna kick out and I need to update the website and refill stores, I have this big magnet board and I use these tiny little magnets and I write down all my projects and each project gets a magnet. And then I group all of those magnets. This is so, so nerdy. I group all those magnets based on what processes they take. So if I'm gonna have to cut stones for you, that has a symbol. So all the stone cutting things are together. So if I'm kicking on my rock machine, I'm busting all that out at once. If I am doing an etching thing and I'm gonna have to get out that chemical, I have all those listed together. I know I'm knocking all those out today. And so I try and kind of move through like that. Um, I have a custom inquiry form on my website that I've started pushing people to, to help me be more organized with things that it asks the first like six or seven questions that I would be asking if we were having this conversation face-to-face -face or via text or whatever but it's also taking their answers and it's a fabulous Google form and it drops them all into a spreadsheet for me. So I have that. And one of the questions I always ask is what's your deadline on this? Because I often have people who are like, oh, I don't know. I've just wanted a mother's ring for forever. So really, truly, whenever you have time, that'd be great. Wow. And then I can put that with the mother's ring that's due September 10th and I can do them all then. And so kind of trying to group like things has been very helpful for me. Um, and then also having to look ahead because I do have to have like physical products to be able to move on in the next week. So one of my goals for every Friday is to look at my list, look at my materials. Do I need to order silver before I start? And that gives me enough time. Usually I know that my deliveries will come on Tuesday morning, which is great because on Mondays I'm taking care of the house. And so kind of just trying to make a list of all the things that I have to do and group them accordingly because there's always things that take more time one place or another. And, um, and part of that is that I set limits on my social media and so I have time. And so it's like, if I only have 30 minutes to get all my mess done on social media, then that only becomes my business time. And then I'm not like scrolling through your vacation photos, which I'm sure are beautiful and lovely, but you're still gonna be my friend if I don't like all 50 of them, so. <laughs> When you, when you talked about, there's so much that you said there, when you, 
okay, so then how do you manage energy? Because energy management is super important. And there are certain things that cause for us to create energy. We can get into that zone as, as they call it flow state where we're, you know, just really just, you know, you lose track of time because you're just in that place and you're, whoa, you know, but then there's other things that are drainers, the things that we're not as strong at that, that might deplete us. How do you manage knowing that you, I love how you said you set those boundaries and those borders on your time by, I set limits on social media. I do this. I, 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 um, I hire out time. I find a, a particular who that can handle the how of, you know, this meal or the cleaning of the house that, that is, that is a, a huge management and like wisdom principle. Now talk about the actual energy of, and even relationships. And you don't have to say names, obviously, <laughs> but if there's, you know, people, sometimes people who reach out to you require more energy. You know, you, you see it on your phone and you say, oh, that's going to take quite a lot of time that I don't have right now. So and there's other people you look at and you say, this person actually creates energy for me. Let me answer this phone and let me take this because I know they've always got something that sparks me and stirs me. So talk about energy management a little. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think first of all, like you can't manage your energy if you aren't aware that your energy is, um, is a depletable thing, right? Like if you don't understand that there are things like you were just saying that are life-giving and things that are life-sucking, like then you just constantly are in a state of different emotions and not being able to have the intelligence to say, well, what, what put me here? How did I get here? You know? And so I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of hate that we can all toss at 2020 in general, but I think for the most part, we could agree that it forced everyone to slow down. And I think, I mean, I don't, I don't know about you, but like that first, you know, those two weeks and it's like, okay, everybody's just going to lay low for a minute. I was like, man, I could probably do that for a couple more weeks. Like, let's. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> and, uh, my girlfriends and I always joke that we were like, what would this have been like if this happened when we were like single? Like, or if we were just married and didn't have babies? Like, man, this would be like, and so, yeah, but anyhow. So I think that like made me a lot more aware of like the need for like rest in particular. And so uh, I'd read a couple, like a book and a study during that time. Um, one was called like emotionally healthy spirituality. And there's like a whole chunk in there about like um, Sabbath and wherever you are on the scale of scripture and all things in that uh, category, I think everyone can, can understand just the need for rest. And the idea of scheduling rest into your routine is just so important. And one of the things, I mean, I, I love like stories I, I learned from those, but um, one of the things, and I think it was in that book that they talked about was um, during like the Oregon Trail, when all of these covered wagons are like pushing to try and get to the coast before the winter sets in and they were slowing down. They, they weren't sure they were gonna make it. And so they like circle up this full band and they're like, okay, what are we gonna do? And they'd been resting every seventh day and half of them wanted to continue to do that. And half of them said, no, deuces we're rolling like we're gonna make it and so they split and the the group of people who chose to rest still beat them to Oregon beat the other people to Oregon because what they had found was that they were they were pushing their oxen too hard so they were you know losing oxen they were losing wheels they weren't having that built-in time to you know, catch their breath and just how important that is. And I have found that that is so valuable um, for me that there's, there's a lot of physical work that happens with what I do. And I am far less likely to make mistakes when I'm sharp. And if I push through and I'm in, a, in an emotionally not great spot or even just a tired spot um, where my energy's low, it's not smart for me to move in on a piece, especially a custom piece that has to move a certain direction. Because if I melt that bezel or, you know, and, and things go wrong. Yesterday alone, I melted two rings and, and was like, and stepped in a steaming pile of dog poop because there's puppies that sometimes hang out with me. And I was like, well, I'm just, I'm over today. And so just to be able to step back in those moments and be like, okay, I could, cut all fresh metal and storm through this with a bad attitude and try and do it again. But if I melt this 
both of these rings for a second time, my kids are not going to be excited about the mom they come home to. So I sometimes have to know like, okay, you got to just step away. And so I stepped away, I drove to town and I got a drink and I ate some food and I sat there and I thought, do I need a nap? Because sometimes I just think a nap is necessary when you're cranky. And, <laughs> and, the, I thought, oh, and all the parents that understand the children that fight <laughs> naps, when there's adults that say, could I have a nap? Can I take a nap? Should I take a nap? And I thought after I'd like stepped away, then I was like, okay, like I feel good about this. I can go back, but I'm not gonna work on those rings today. Those rings have already been a lot for me today. So I'm gonna move on down the line and work on a couple other other projects that um, that I, I knew I could get done. So kind of just, uh, I think there's always just that mental check. And like you said, of like being like, oh, do I have to answer this? And I think in business, I, I think in all areas of life really like, um, we're just, we're a little too accessible. There's some wonderful, wonderful things to the accessibility that we have, um, with technology. I mean, you and I would never be having this conversation. Um, and you know, we had kind of our pre-conversation on the phone and I had had like a really like tiring week. And I was telling my husband later about our chat and I was like, it was just so life-giving to be like, oh man, like here's somebody that's kind of like pulling the same way. And I felt like you were just so encouraging. And I had just so loved that, but on the flip side of that is that we have this mentality that if somebody reaches out to me, I have to answer right now. Mm -hmm. And, and that I have to hear all of the opinions of all of the people. And I especially want young people to hear that if you wouldn't let 50 people march into your bedroom and tell you their opinion of what you did today, then do not lay in your bed that night and scroll through it and read it. Do not feel like you have to respond to how somebody felt about the fact that you don't look good in red. Who cares? You liked it. You wore it. You put it out there. Move on. Like, and so just, I, and I think that's really hard to do, hard to understand where those lines are and boundaries because we are so quick to hear the ping, pick up our phone, read it, and sometimes even not responding, sometimes just opening it up and reading it can be a huge energy suck, you know, like, yes. um, and that's, and that's terrible. And then, you know, I, I did have a situation where someone, um, sent me this message on, um, Instagram and she had seen some of my work and felt like it looked similar to her work, which as an artist is like a really like, you know, like you're like, oh my gosh, like, is this, you know, what did I do? And so I was like walking, like we had a great back and forth really. And, um, I like sent it to several of my friends because that's what you do, right? You just step back to junior high girl mode. Like, am I seeing this? Am I doing this right? Did I mess this up? And, really? um, you know, and, and I just, I just literally felt sick to my stomach. It was, this is dumb. It was my favorite day of the year here. We burn all of our grass out here. Nice. And, and we just set these huge fires. It's amazing. And it, it's safe for the environment, so I just don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. Look it up. It's how we preserve the Flint Hills, or it would be taken over by random trees that are not indigenous, so it's really a good thing, but anyhow, it's so fun. So we light these huge fires. My husband and I will put the kids to bed early, and then we go out and set things on fire. It's my favorite, and so we were like, he was getting all the supplies. This pings in. I open it. Why did I open it? I don't know, and then it's this message, and it just felt like a gut punch, and it just like ruined my whole day, and like just and really that whole week, I just felt sick about it and, um, you know, responded and it ended up being fine. But man, you just, uh, that's just such a dangerous territory to not have like some amount of guards on things that are like a time stuck. And ultimately, like, I feel like if you treat people well, it's not going to really matter if it took you a day to respond or two minutes to respond. Like if you handle it well, and a lot of times I think handling it well means giving yourself some space. Like if you're burned out and then I all of a sudden made a promise to somebody that I could get something done, but I forgot because I was doing something else at the same time. If I sit down and I'm intentional with my time and energy, um, that goes a lot further. And sometimes that actually means slowing down, which is not, uh, just not common. <laughs> Huge, huge, huge uh, dot connectors right there on so much. When you talked about that of guarding the guardrails around your time and around your energy and some of the things you've learned reflective, can you talk as well about uh, how you've 
chose your association. So there, there, you know, there's the dream builders, and then there's somewhat the dream stillers or dream killers that people are they are negative about. Oh well, it's you know you have a piece of art, and you know, you know that you know it's phenomenal, not because of some self, but just because you've done your work with the market. You know how to add value, and you know it, it resonates with your specific tribe and avatar and then you might have someone else around you who doesn't know anything about it. it's like it's okay i don't know you know how do you how did you deal with that in re regards to growing up to be the artist that you are now and that you are becoming in the future how did you deal with managing uh people's expectations and their commentaries and even you talked about that with young people and guardrails but anybody being a creative how did you deal with okay i do feedback's important yet I'm not going to let feedback stop me from creating. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's a great question. And for me, I think, um, I think the biggest thing is um, to value your identity and be very careful what containers you let hold that. Um, and so I think if my identity is solely in um, what I'm doing with jewelry and art, um, that's a real fragile container that it doesn't take much that if somebody, you know, is like, hmm, no, I don't like that. I don't wear big earrings. Um, or my favorite, oh, that looks like something you would wear. I see you. I read what's between the lines here. So, <laughs> like, you know, those things, like, all of a sudden become, like, these huge detrimental things. And I think that, oh, I'm going to try and not, like, step too deep into this right now. But I feel like that's something that I see as, like, a crisis within um within our country and probably just society in general right now is that we so desperately want to find the right container to hold our identity. And, and in that, I, I think we somehow feel like that would give us freedom, like that that is, that's the answer. And I don't think that's the answer. Like, I think if you can't find value in yourself as a person, um, and, you know, personally, I believe that everybody is created and that our rights are like God given. They are not um, given to us by policies and politics and other people. Um, but that, and that's one of my values that you can find right away is that like we value people as people. And, and as such, like I want to love them well, simply because you're a person. Like you deserve love and respect simply because you're a person. And sometimes I think we feel like we deserve love and respect because of this thing that we do or these things that we love or what we wear or you know, whatever that might be. And all of those are just so fragile because people can take shots at that, right? Like, um, and so I think that, uh, I don't know if that's like answering your question really <laughs> very well. But like, I'm like, I go on that train for a while, but I think, um, so for me, I, I don't wanna be like, it was easy, but kind of because, um, because that just wasn't, that wasn't my identity. We actually had a gal who lived with us. Um, she's lived with us two different times for, uh, oh, like nine months or so. And the first time she lived with us, she didn't even know that I did this. Like she didn't even know I did jewelry. It's just not something like, I'm like, she would know I'd go out back and like work on some stuff, but she never walked out there, I guess. I don't know. And I never really felt the need to tell her because our relationship wasn't built on that. And, um, and so, yeah, so I was like, that was just, um, it was fine. <laughs> so I think, uh, I think I'm drawn to, to other people who value people as people. And so um, I grew up in a house of all boys and my dad was a football coach. And so I have a really bizarre set of things that I can do. And my mom and I were talking about this this week and I was talking about, you know, um, there are a lot of things that on paper, I don't really look very girly. Like I have more power tools than most men I know. Um, I have no qualms with picking up a snake in my yard and getting rid of it or identifying it or whatever I need to do. Um, I, on my college transcript, had a football scholarship because I worked so closely with the team. That's how they got wow. <laughs> that money. I mean, I just, I have a wide variety of interests and things. And so, um, and so I think because of that, like I, I never really had it one thing that I could put, this is my identity and this is all in this. And so that made it easier for me um, to accept criticism because I was like, 
okay. Like I, I felt pretty strongly in who I was and where I was. Um, when I was in college, I um, went to a Mennonite school and I'm not Mennonite. And I was not rehired as an RA because um, I wore bright colors and was not a typical Mennonite girl. And I said, totally great. Yep. Don't know that you can legally tell me that it was told whatever. And I was like, I'm not that I'm not going to be that. And I can remember as part of this whole process, they had me sit down with um, another RA who found me intimidating. And she said, sometimes you answer questions and then nobody else feels like they can answer. And I was like, okay, I'm sorry. I do talk a lot. My apologies. And she said, but sometimes they ask a question and you don't answer. So none of us feel like we can answer. And I said, oh, now see this, this isn't about me. This is about you. So you can keep going through this if you want. Like, um, the, she had a list, she had a, a multiple page list of things she didn't like about me, which we sat through. Um, and, and ultimately like, even in that moment, like, like while that should have probably been like a really hurtful thing, I can just remember thinking like, I just feel really sad that you can't see that these are options for you too. Like that you can answer the questions that you can choose to not answer the questions. Like, and so I think that that, I think you kind of have to be considering of things. And so dependent, not necessarily on what is said, but how it's said, I think you can figure out a lot um, as far as whether or not that's criticism that you should take to heart. And I think when people really want you to take it to heart, those might be the ones you let slide. I, I hope you do more writing. One of the things in your article that said, you said was too often we hang up our talents hoping for just the right season or opportunity. And in the waiting, we miss opportunities to grow, learn, and create. We miss lessons learned and people met. Don't let fear or circumstance hold you back from doing your thing right now, wherever you are. And you know, the Theodore, the Teddy Roosevelt, do what you can with what you have where you are. Can you elaborate on how in this tumultuous time for a lot of people, because I don't know what time this will be viewed. That's why I don't throw out a timestamp, but whatever people will end up viewing, listening to this. Can you talk about, you know, that the that time frame where people, or just the seasons that people go through and how you respond to that, how you personally have remained creative in the midst of, it's not, you don't feel creative, right? <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, absolutely. Like, I think, um, I think everybody has like different seasons in their life. And, um, and I think, you know, to touch back a little bit on like energies, like actually creating something is very energizing for me, especially without parameters. So when I get to make something that doesn't really have a destination, that's great. Um, I do some painting. I don't sell any of my paintings. I just like to paint. It's um, just very freeing to me. And um, even when people order things, there's a little hand painted, tiny little thank you note. And I paint those and I paint them all because it's just a something that has like no pressure. Nobody paid for the painted thing. They don't care. Um, they're gonna throw it away anyway, but it gives me energy. And so I think sometimes uh, as creatives, people forget that that like gives you energy. But I also feel that that's probably true about anything that you are naturally gifted at. I think when we use our gifts and skills, um, that that is energizing to us. And so I think often we think whatever that might be. So I'm using art because that's kind of, you know, my world here, but you know, I, I'll see like a lot of, um, I see young moms in particular that will say like, well, I chose to stay home. So I can't, you know, paint or I can't do whatever. Um, and I'm, I'm always a little baffled by that because I feel like that is a culture shift from what we would have even seen with like my great grandparents that they had a farm. And so everyone knew how to work the farm because the kids went out and worked the farm. Like that part of their childhood was playing alongside their mom while she planted a garden. And in turn, they learned how to plant a garden. And so there are things, and, and I think sometimes um, kids getting to see you be passionate about something helps them realize that they want something to be passionate about, right? Like it's why, it's how changing my major happened. It's that I'm looking at 
Eileen Ratzliff and going, you are so passionate about this and I can't keep my eyes open and this isn't where I'm supposed to be. And so it, that just seeing someone be passionate about something helps. And so doing what you can with what you have sometimes means dialing back your, your vision, right? Like, so I'm not going to go open a store right now that I need all these pieces to fill because I don't have that time, but maybe I do have nap time. And instead of just laying down and hoping that they sleep, I, which I did this regularly, just staying as quiet as possible until they wake up. Maybe I just like get out a sketchbook and I just sketch some things. And I have tons of sketchbooks from things that I did. And I will look back and, and pull out a design that I made five or six years ago. Um, because also knowing what I have is that I usually have limited time. There's that game show. I don't think it's still on, but I don't have cable. So it's called like Minute to Win It. And I feel like Minute to Win It is like made for moms. Like I'm like, yeah, that, this is our life all the time. Like, yeah, can you put all the tissues back in the tissue box before they unroll the toilet paper? Go. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, that's, that's just what we do. And so, so for me, like being able to say, okay, maybe I only have 20 minutes in my shop, but if I have if I don't have to come up with the idea in 20 minutes, if I can just open up my sketchbook and make that thing that's there, then I'm going to actually get somewhere and I'm going to find that energy instead of just being like, I don't have enough time to do it. So I'm going to eat pretzels and hang out. Like, you know, and so I think, I just think there's always ways to do the things that you're gifted at. But sometimes you have to be creative in how you get that out. You know, if you're a speaker, like, volunteer at your kid's school and see, you know, even if you're reading a book or, um, yeah, just like whatever, there's always, there's always options. And I think that we get caught in the lie of, I don't have the energy for the thing that I love. And I think that is where life gets real boring, real fast. So you create those micro moments. It sounds like when you, uh, I, I like this other quote you said, and then I have a uh, I'd be remiss first. Actually, let's do this now. I'd be remiss if I had a, a, a concert violinist on and then I never had any samples of what they do. Do you happen to have any of your art that you've created with you? With me right now? Yes. Yes. I mean, I'm pretty much always wearing something. Can you, so, can, can you tell us about one of the, can you take one of the and describe it for those that are listening auditory and then also show it for the ones that are Viewing. Yeah, for sure. So I, um, I like big pieces. Um, I, I, but I would also say that I like to be able to design for people's personalities. But like, I had a customer come in and say, I, I drew this thing. And I was like, I don't know if she's gonna like this. The top of it, I'm gonna say was about two and a half inches by three inches. And she said, I don't know, do you think it's big enough? And I was like, yes, you are my people. So uh, I'll talk about um, the ring that I'm wearing right now. It's one that I made more eh, fairly recently, I guess. Um, and I pretty much am always wearing something. And usually there's a ring that I'm in love with. So this is my current ring that I'm in love with. So um, it's a black and white um, zebra agate. It's reminiscent of white buffalo turquoise, if you're familiar with that. Um, it's about two and a half inches long, probably a half inch wide. Um, I'm not always the best at guessing sizes, um, but one, it has kind of one of my signature bands, which is um, like a saddle style that's adjustable because while I really like big things, comfort and daily wear is what I always want for all my pieces. Whether or not you choose to wear it like that, I want you to not not be able to wear it like that, if that makes sense. So um, the saddle band, it's like really fat on the top of my finger where people see it, but where my hand closes, it comes down to about uh, three eighths of an inch. And so I have still full closure on my hands when I'm wearing it. Um, and then I'm really a fan of this like matte silver finish because I'm likely going to bang it up on things and it will not show that wear as much. So, um, and then one of the other things that I often do if I'm going to do a large piece is I actually offset my bands. And so um, if you could see it, you could see that the band sits closer to the top of the stone as opposed to the middle. And that allows the longer portion of the stone to fall back on my hand um, as opposed to like up on my finger that I want to be able to bend. And that keeps me from getting things caught if I can keep it um, below that first knuckle. Wow. 
I, uh, so you, I, I love this quote that you said. It said, I hope you read, uh, it says, if you're reading this, I hope you're doing something with what you have. If you're sketching on napkins from today's takeout, I'll bet they're beautiful. If you're working from a shoebox under your bed, I hope you regularly spread your contents and immerse yourself there. If you've carved out a space in your spare bedroom, may it bring you all the inspiration you need for today. If you're waiting for the day you have a full and perfect studio, you never will. Your work doesn't need a studio space. Your work needs you to show up and do what you can with what you have where you are. That, my friend, is what had me reach out is because it's imperative that people learn to produce in the midst of, to be fruitful in the midst of what seems like affliction or hard times. Um, can you encourage the, those who might be parents of creatives in some of the ways that they can cultivate that in their children as we're about to wrap up? Can you, can you give a little insight if someone is listening and they happen to be the parent of a creative or they were a creative and it's bottled up now and now they say, you know, I'm 60 years old and maybe it's too late or I don't, you know, I don't know the range. I get a lot of feedback. <laughs> I want to know, you know, just whatever it is you sense. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, man, one of the things that I love about little kids, like little, little kids, is if you ask them to draw a picture of something, none of them will say, I can't draw. Like if you say, can you, can you draw yourself? Yeah, absolutely. I can. <laughs> and you know, whether or not you can recognize it as a person, that's irrelevant to them. They know exactly what it is. And so I think somewhere along the line, you know, all of a sudden we see, we see a Van Gogh or we see, you know, some other phenomenal artist and we think, well, I can't do that. Well, of course you can't. That's not yours. You're not meant to do that. That's not the life you're meant to live. And so I think just like, just encouraging kids like um, with whatever, whatever they're doing and that, they don't have to be the master of it. There doesn't have to be an end goal. Um, and it doesn't have to look like something. And I think with the language that you use as a parent with a creative, like um, comments on the process and or questions are going to be a lot better um, criticism and encouragement for them than, um, than saying like, oh, that's a, re that's a really good picture, you know? Um, or what is that? Like, that's not a question to ask. Tell me about that, you'll get more. Um, what made you pick those colors? Uh, just asking, asking questions that allow your child to like kind of explain it is really good. And then just, you know, having things available. I think a lot of times parents don't wanna do things that are like, oh, it's such a mess. I'm totally with you totally there. Um, it's like, can I paint? No, I don't want you to paint. I just wiped off the table. But, you know, like coming up with those, like those uh, different ground options. Like we have a table and it's, I'm sitting at it right now. Like it's our art room table and there is Play-Doh stuck to this chair beside me that I'm just going to let dry up and go after with a razor blade at this point. And so it's just, uh, giving people space, giving the kids space to do things. And, and it might not even be, um, it might not even be art stuff. You know, I have, I have a kid who's really mechanical and he, he loves Legos and he likes, um, he, recently he was kind of into this, like, uh, building armor. Like he wanted to build armor. And I was like, well, I'm not going to give you sheet metal. What can we do? And so he was cutting up our Amazon boxes and making like, full body like night armor with like movable parts and you know and so I often will just be like hey what do we need for our craft cabinet and they tell me and then I get it and stick it in there and try and just give them the the freedom to do that but I think also just kids you know letting them try lots of different things like um I think it's a huge downfall to be like if they're like and I, I really like to paint well you're a really good painter so let's try clay well they don't have to be a clay person like and uh, let them let them just go and figure out what they're good at and what they love in whatever category that might be. You have a person who is a creative and now they're almost a repressed or they push down their creativity because they were told that they would be a starving artist, but they know that they do have an ability. So maybe they secretly do that medium, but they're not sharing it with anybody because there might be a lot of shame around it. What would you say to a person who is finds themselves in that state? Yeah, I would say uh, start small. I mean, I think 
I think the idea that people are like making it, I think that's like a huge, a huge first step is that you chose to continue that um, despite being told that you shouldn't or that you couldn't. And if you are a person who knows you can, but you haven't, doing it, that's the first step. Do it, start small. Um, and then maybe you just like hang a piece up in your house that you are just love and are really proud of. You don't even have to sign it. You don't have to tell anybody that you painted it. It can just hang there. And if somebody's like, oh, you get that at the Goodwill, then yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> I don't know where it exactly originated. Not untrue. You don't know exactly where that canvas was stretched. So, I mean, I think, uh, I think starting, starting small and figuring out, um, you know, maybe, maybe that's just, you paint a birthday card for a friend that you, that you love. I think that a lot of times people downplay how much giving a, a creative piece to someone means to the receiver. Um, and so I think that's, that's something like, you know, you have your people, you have your safe spaces, start with them, like just give them some things. Where, where do you see Sandcastle going? Where do you see it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I more think, writing in the future. <laughs> I do. I do love writing. I, I mean, that's why I thought communications would be my game. But um, yeah, I think uh, I go a lot of different directions and think like, okay, maybe this. And uh, I think you have to be really comfortable with a pivot. So I'll toss out a couple of like things that I've thought about knowing full well that it might pivot into something totally different. Um, I would still love at some point to, um, to move into a downtown space. I mean, we have a very small downtown, but it's vibrant and I love, I have a lot of great relationships with business owners down there. And it would just be really fun to be able to work and also meet my friend for coffee or lunch, you know, and just get to be part of that business community in, in location would be great. Um, I would really love the opportunity, I mean, you touched on it. I touched on it in the article. I love getting to encourage people to do the things that they're called to do. And I think it would be a really cool opportunity to have a space that allowed for some business incubation where um, several of, I, like I mentioned, of several great business friends, where some of them who are really talented at like the bookkeeping side or the business side or the marketing side or the um, customer relations side, where we would all begin to be able to pour into small businesses and kind of just give them a really great jump start. Because I think that there's a lot of people who could do a lot with some of those opportunities. And I mean, big picture dreaming, I would love to have a space that I could do that. And I'm hosting you and holding you. And then by the time you're done and ready to go, you can afford, you know, to rent one of the empty buildings that's downtown. Because there's a lot of empty buildings, but I'd love nothing more than to see those full of awesome places doing the things that they that they want to do. So maybe something like that uh, somewhere down the line. But yeah, so almost in, almost cultivating and 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 uh, sending out those who are because um, you speak of the incubator, so it's almost homegrown. You're, you're yeah building. Yeah, up. I think so. There's a there's a place in Wichita that gets to do some things like that. And she's done it really well. And, um, and I think that's just a really interesting concept. I think there's a lot of kind of cooperative ways that you can make, um, that you can make it more accessible for people to kind of dip their toes into being a business owner without jumping all into um, to the full overhead of what that looks like. And I think, uh, I think letting people do the thing that they're passionate about while you slowly open their eyes to like, See, you can you can do this for your livelihood. Um, that would be a really that just be a really cool opportunity. When you have um, you talked early on, and this is a I thought my, that was my last question, but I thought about this question as you were answering. <laughs> what would you say to those that think that they have to flee to the bigger cities to make something happen? versus the concept of almost prospering where you're planted and kind of assessing, because you assessed and you said it wasn't, you didn't just go because you couldn't afford it. I mean, if, if I don't think you're naive to believe that, oh, you know, I didn't, the reason why I just didn't go is because I didn't have the money. There's also, there's, there's something about location and there's something that's happening. 
as a result and you are having impact right where you're at in a place where others say no you've got to go to the big places where they you got to go where the big trade far fairs are at and you got to go where you can get the most exposure can you talk a, a bit about how you can prosper where you're planted versus maybe the first thing smoking out of town i'm out of here <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right yeah absolutely i think uh i i read an article i wish i could remember what it was even from it was either right after college or kind of at the end of my college career that was talking about um, being a lifestyle entrepreneur, that this like new wave, new generation of entrepreneurs who aren't necessarily setting out to be like, I want to start a billion dollar company. They're saying, this is the way that I want to live. How do I work to do that? I mean, it would be a similar concept to like the four hour work week. Right. Um, and so for me, like, I think that there was a time that living uh, in a more urban environment was really appealing. Um, it's not anymore <laughs> for a whole number of reasons, but it's just, it's not um, anymore. And I think, I think that it has continually, um, how do I want to say this? My husband and I talk about this a lot because he teaches people to fly and move small aircraft and has, a whole aircraft company in a town where people don't always know we have an airport at all. <laughs> and so um, I think that something that I believe to be true is that if you um, work hard at what you're doing, and if you know you said, if you don't let your talent take you um, where your character can't, I love that statement. Um, that, you know, for me, I want to make sure that I'm always giving my customers like the best of my time, the best of my thoughts, um, that I'm giving them individualized attention. That's very important to me. I can't do that if I have more customers than I have time. And I can't do that if I'm spread really thin, which I feel like I would be in a larger capacity. And so um, just being able to take the process and go, one step at a time. And, um, and so I think for me, the slow pace of the Midwest has been a really great business incubator. I don't think it limits what I can do. I think at one point I thought that it probably did, but I think that it paces what I can do. And, and I think having, having a pace set is, is always a great plan within a business, but, um, yeah, so I don't know. I don't know if that helps. In my head, I thought I'll oh, move to New York and I'll buy a cool space and make funky things and sell to to different people. And that you know that might have been true, but I imagine that I wouldn't have really known the people. That I would have just you know interacted with them briefly. And um, and I think if you pour like a bunch of money and energy into things that you're not ready for, uh, it fails. And I think you see that often in, you know, startup companies, like what the percentages that actually make it, like it's not super high. And so making sure that you're doing well with what you have where you are allows a natural pace to happen for your business. And I think that's important. You're naturally scaling. That is, um, that is very timely uh, with the, the, and the, there's data that backs that uh, in the global shutdown when and whenever you're viewing or listening to this the a, after the global shutdown there's a lot of data of people when when it was happening they started to really assess the space that they lived in and a lot of those big places that you named off people fled out of there because they said wait a minute i'm spending all this for only this and no disrespect to those coastal cities and all that but people looked at that and they said wait a minute i could probably this is what it this this is what I strive for this type of lifestyle I could actually create that now and I could you know move to a different place so it's, it's just interesting that the idea to quote unquote make big is being defined people are redefining now almost to you know okay what's a what is a noble and a you know almost godly way to look at things rather than just looking at what everyone else says is is success it's redefining that so that very very Absolutely. well and i think i think the other side of that too is um 
you know, like I mentioned, you asked about like, how did I feel like when I made a thousand dollars? There's probably a time that prior to that, you could have said, how would you feel if you make a thousand dollars? And I'd be like, like, I made it. Like, that'd be the best. I'd take all my friends to dinner. And instead I was just exhausted. And um, Caleb and I, that's my husband, we've talked about that. Like, there's lots of things that like, um, there are things that have always been like goals. Like I've always thought, man, it'd be really great to break into gold and it'd be really neat to get to make, um, some diamond engagement rings. And on the back side of having done that, um, at the end of the day, it's still just, it's just a thing. Like it was, it was a thing I got to do. It was cool. Um, but I mean, it's, my business is called Sandcastle Jewelry because it is a very, um, it, it is a business that is very materialistic and I was going to need a constant reminder that it needs its place, that uh, it's not the, I'm not trying to build a kingdom here. <laughs> wow. So elaborate on why you chose Sand, Sandcastle as the name, since you just touched a little on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I had to name it actually right before that show um, because I had to have a tax ID to participate. And so you need a business name for tax ID. And at that point in time, I was memorizing the Sermon on the Mount. And, you know, at Matthew 7 talks about uh, building a life on the rock versus a life on the sand. And I'm sitting there looking at like a bunch of broken jewelry and things like that and thinking, wow, this is like really, really temporary. And um, I'm going to need a reminder that this is really temporary. And so that was where I was like, it's a sandcastle. It's a sandcastle. It's here. It'll be gone. And, you know, at some point, like my, some of my kids decide to do this. Sure. Great. They'll have a head start. But my husband realistically just told me that the old gentleman that lives across the street needs to outlive me so that he can run my estate sale because he's not going to know what to do with all this crap. <laughs> <laughs> so. I, I love it. So where can people find you and, and you know, what's up, ne what's coming up next and, and where can people find you? I, I want them to be. Sure, to sure. Um, so my website is sandcastlejewelry.com. And uh, if I'm going to be anywhere, I try and like send that out on a mailing list. I don't do too many shows um, because I have a lot of little people now, but I will have an open house in October. So if you're in the Midwest and you want to check that out, get on my mailing list and I'll uh, get you all that information. But uh, I can also be found on social media. Both ha my handle is always at Sandcastle Jewelry. I think technically I hold a Twitter space, but I've never understood that mess. So same with TikTok. Don't follow me there. Uh, but Instagram, Facebook, I'm there. Everything else, I'm like, oh, I'm too old to figure this out. <laughs> when you, uh, when you, as as we close out, what you you talked about Matthew seven or whatnot? Is there some? Is there something that encourages you to continue to remain creative? In the, in the times when you don't? Do you have anything that, is, is there a phrase? Is there a verse? Is there anything that hits you that says, man, you know what? I'm gonna continue doing this because like you said, it's energy creating, but people have hard stuff that happens in their life that does not make them want to, like they said, that when you got that message even, or, and there's other things that happen, seasonal changes where it feels like that gut punch and you're saying, man, I just got the wind knocked out of me. Yeah, absolutely. So I think when things get hard, there's like a practice that I go back to um, as part of like, I'm, I try and read Bible every day, but one of the things that I found to be really um, beneficial for me mentally, especially when things just feel hard is uh, I make lists. And so I make three lists and then um, I have a statement. So my three lists, well, sometimes four lists. So I'll make a list of things that I need to surrender, all the things that I'm just holding, that I'm holding in my head that I have no control over. Like some, there's something to me about putting it down as a bullet point on a list that lets me let go of that, that day and not think about it further. So what am I surrendering? What am I thankful for? Um, so I do affirmations, but I do them probably a little bit different than some people I do. You know, what do I know to be true? Like, what do I know to be true? And a lot of those, hey, Nelly, can you wait just a second? <laughs> Um, I had Real a life. Real life. <laughs> Woo! Um, and so, uh, so things, what do I know to be true? Um, you know, I know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him. Like I write like lots of little scriptures usually as part of that affirmation or paraphrasing them. Um, and then one of the things that I worked on, um, 
really over the course of 2020, because it felt like such a weird time, um, was just like, what would, it, what would my personal mission statement be? Like if I had a personal mission statement, and that's going to be different than my business mission statement, because my business isn't me. It's not exactly who I am. And so my personal mission statement, and I usually write it and not, I should have it where I can look at it, but um, is says something to the likes of um, to creatively serve the people around me, to cultivate my home, to steward my talents, to um, shepherd my children, and to bring glory to the Lord. And writing those things down, like knowing that here's what God has given me. Here's what I'm supposed to be doing with it. Just seeing that in writing day in and day out during times that everything else feels like sand, finding the rock, standing on it. And that's, uh, that's what I try and do. Awesome. I think that's a great place for people to stop because it makes people slow down in the midst of all the fastness, we can slow down and kind of assess where we're at. So thank you for your time today. Thank you for being a part of this show. I look forward to hearing the feedback and seeing the work that you're doing. We look forward to hearing more great things from Sandcastle because it is uh, imperative that people are liberated to create and that people can see beauty in the things that are somewhat hard. You talked about looking at rocks and metal and things that you can see that's a gift. My wife has uh, the ability, to, I, she gets it from obviously my father-in-law, but they can, they can look at spaces and that are all torn up and they tell me, oh my gosh, this is so beautiful. You can see, and they can transform a space and make it beautiful. Whereas I'm on, I want to see it done. I see something done. I'm like, that's nice right here. Let's get that. Let's not put all that sweat equity in. I want the event. So it's encouraging that you shared your process and I look forward to hearing more of what Sandcastle was up to. So thanks for being on the show. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Do us a favor. If this was useful in any way for you, please go to iTunes and leave us a review. Reviews will allow others to easily discover the podcast. If you'd like more information and to receive a free download, rediscover your destiny, go to ceoofdestiny.com. Thanks again and tune in next time.